Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Is Natasha, ma'am, there? Yes, she's connected. Okay. Well, Natasha, ma'am, we'll start probably in the next. Once we have a, a twenty count, we'll go ahead with the session. Sure. Thank you. uh i we have a substantial amount of participants and probably they'll be joining in very soon uh nevertheless we shall start with our program right now so a very warm welcome to all the participants to a yet another uh, webinar on a very interesting topic which is diversity and inclusion diversity and inclusion in the past uh, was quite unknown but in the present scenario this is the key to success of any business it is all business houses which are succeeding are working by including uh, diversity at their workplace it is rightly said by uh, mahatma gandhi ji that our ability to reach unity unity in diversity will be the beauty and the test of our civilization so in today's era any business house or any business strategy has gained the traction in the corporate world as its benefits have become increasingly clear now when we speak about work, the work diversity means variation that is people from different variations will come together variations in terms of their different races ethnicities genders ages religions dis uh, disabilities sexual orientations and with differences in education personalities skill sets and experience so this is a diversified uh, uh, category and when they come together and when we include them in our workplace for obtaining our business purposes or business goals it is termed as diversity and inclusion there are a lot of uh, ways and means that we can include such variations and achieve our goals to facilitate us on this topic we have with us uh, ms natasha khair a very warm welcome to you uh, ms natasha to rcf and thank you for accepting our invitation for uh, uh, exposing us to this new measure of hr which is uh, the key to success of any businesses in the present scenario uh, before i invite you to start your session i would take an uh, the opportunity to speak about uh, your biodata so natasha khair is the india's lead of diversity and inclusion for cognizant she joined cognizant in 2015 in the role of senior manager lnd cognizant digital operations she has close to two decades of work experiences across various brands like g capital wns global barclays and accenture in the areas of language training leadership and behavior and diversity and inclusion she is invited as a speaker on many forums and the lnd forums primarily on the themes of leadership and diversity inclusion she carries many esteemed academic and vocational certificates under her belt she is certified design thinking expert and also an expert for mbti and nlp practitioner the most recent one being a certified diversity professional from diversity training university uh, california her vision is to make all of us work towards the betterment of each of us uh, madam natasha is a science graduate then a masters in management and she's done her management from xlri jamshedpur so a very warm welcome natasha ma'am again once again and uh, we have a forum and we are eager to uh, listen to you on this uh, topic on diversity and inclusion thank you thank you so much pali uh, it's a pleasure being here and i really appreciate this collaboration with share your hr uh, so appreciate being here and and the fact that there are organizations and there are industries that are willing to invest in dni it's um, it's a fairly important pillar like you said and we'll talk about everything else that i have uh, during the course of the session uh, so you please let me know when you can sh uh, when you can see my screen you're not audible ma'am yeah can you hear me yeah now i can hear you yeah okay great um can you see my screen as well uh as of now no i'm not unable yeah i can see it right away right now i can see it yeah i can see it ma'am 
Okay, great. <clears throat> so this is what we'll talk about. Um, if you have any questions, um, thank you. Thank you, Rupali. Uh, and this is for the group. Thank you so much for being here today. We are going to try and keep it brief. And at the same time, we'll try and convey the message that we intend to. Uh, what we are going to talk about today is something that, um, that a lot of us are already aware of. We talk about these pieces throughout our day to different people in different ways. And we'll touch upon each of those topics today. Um, if you have any questions, you feel free to write them in the chat window and Larissa can manage the chat window for us. And you can also unmute yourself towards the end of the session and ask your questions. Sure. Okay. So what you see on the screen is, um, is what we are going to talk about today. Inclusion in the new normal. Right. What does that mean? Before we get to anything else, I want to ask you, what does the word normal mean to you? And this is for everybody on the call right now. Unmute yourself and you can answer this question. What does the word normal mean to you? Accepting the present scenario. What's the meaning of the word? Accepting the present scenario. Accepting the present scenario. OK. What else? Yep. To make it a way of life. Anything else that normal means to you? A way of life. All right. Wonderful. What else? Anything else? Something which was not acceptable. Something that's life. not out of the ordinary for us. It is an acceptable normal. It's a change. Yep which was not acceptable to us in the past, but uh, okay, wonderful. Certain so there are, uh, we have to uh, accept this in the present scenario and make it normal. If you're making it normal, that's not what the word normal means to you, right? You accept it as normal. I'm talking about what does the word normal mean to you? For example, accepting the way it is. Correct. You, you're saying that, hey, it's nothing different. Or like somebody said, it's a way of life, right? And that's what the word normal means to you. Um, let's see what we have. Uh, during this time, right? And specifically, I'm talking about the past six months where, uh, unfortunately, the, the world has been struck by COVID. And during this corona crisis, there are so many things that have come out in the open, which we never thought were normal. And therefore, they were a myth. OK, we are going to expose a few myths to see what is it that we were looking at. Right. Can you tell me a couple of examples of a few myths that you thought were, you know, that's not normal. That's not how things are done. And that is what is being done in the times of Corona. Can you think of any such examples? Wearing a mask itself. And I'd request people to unmute themselves and respond. <laughs> yeah, wearing a mask itself. It was never termed as normal, but now it is. Washing hands frequently. Anything else that has happened during this time? Washing hands, all right. I'd urge the others also to respond. How we, often had we imagined that we will be working from home? And care for How the family. often did we see um, in care for the family? Yes, thank you. At the same time, right? Many people now, when they are on video calls, they have their children coming into the room. Some cases, children are sitting in the lap, and the parents are still on conversations during video calls. It is not considered as oh my god anymore, because it is considered as normal now, right? Earlier, and, and I'm talking about households that I personally know, earlier uh, in many, many houses, and I'm not generalizing it, but in many houses, men would not go into the kitchen because, hey, that's not my space. But now there are men who are cooking in the kitchen because women are working. And women are taking care of things that the men were taking care of earlier. It is a balanced responsibility. The roles have changed, or even in certain scenarios, uh, mixed up now because it is not assigned to one gender or or one scenario, right? If somebody is working a different hour, then the other partner is taking care of other stuff that was earlier supposed to be taken care of by the first partner. And all of that is considered as normal now, right? Uh, if you look at 
even important and mandatory services like doctors doctors are now meeting everybody online there are online consultations happening why is that because that's now considered as normal an online consultation by a doctor was earlier assumed to be ineffective and doctors would say hey you know i'm not going to do that i rather meet the patient now it's necessary to get that done over the phone and people are doing it right so there are so many things that you see which didn't happen earlier and are happening now they were termed to be as a myth earlier but those things are now called as normal so the definition of the word normal really can be different in different scenarios can be different from one person to another so my normal may not be your normal it will be completely different for you and it can be and it can be the same as well so depending on where i am today and where somebody else is today the normals can be different from us and that's what i'm trying to convey to you right which is why it takes us to a point where when we look at our workforce in the office something that is expected out of one person may not necessarily be expected out of the other and we'll discuss more of that during the day today uh these are the kind of things we are talking about what changed during corona and work from since the work from home started the initial findings i'll pick a report and i'll discuss a report published certified and registered report with you uh we're talking about recognizing and embracing differences and we're also going to be talking about impact on women and how the leadership uh from a perspective of support in terms of men being allies in terms of what is it that we can convey from a fact of uh women being more uh, effective leaders how do we cover all of those pieces is what going uh, going to be covered today right um so we were talking about myths being busted most of these myths that we have examples that we have talked about were habits the habit has been that the woman is going to cook in the kitchen because that's how typically generations have gone by but if you look at the most famous cooks today most famous cooks are men right there has been an assumption around the fact that hey women cannot be in jobs that are marketing related jobs or sales related jobs but today you see women in delivery you see women in uh, sales jobs in client facing jobs in marketing jobs there is nothing that women are not doing there was a little assumption assumption that men can only do macho jobs but today you see men as cooks today you see men as receptionists today you see men as doctors for women gynecologists and more and today you see a lot more roles that were only associated to women earlier that men are also doing very very wonderfully right earlier men were assumed to be you know being a uh, being a homemaker was an absolutely acceptable term and it was an assumption that a homemaker has to be a woman today you hear the term called house husband and there are many such people who choose to be house husbands because they are artists they are freelancers and they want probably one person in the family to be getting a salaried income to keep the house afloat and the other person is working on their passion which is absolutely acceptable in today's time right um assumptions around work from home can you talk about or can you give me examples about what were the assumptions earlier before covid hit us about working from home anybody an assumption around working from home was work from home considered effective what kind of an assumption came along with the moment you say hey i'd like to work from home was it accepted and there's no right or wrong answer here anybody can uh, respond can you all hear me yes can you yes. all hear me Yes yes. yes 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 okay all right i just thought there was so much silence i assumed that maybe i'm not audible yeah, work from uh, from home uh, okay. accepted so um assumptions from um, around the world for working from home i'm sorry i couldn't understand that could you please say it one more time 
<clears throat> I'm sorry, I couldn't understand that. Somebody was trying to say something. Okay. So, so allow me to uh, share some information that <laughs> when we were talking about work from home, a while back, work from home would, was termed as ineffective. Work from home was termed as the fact that people who are working from home are not doing the best of their jobs because it's not possible to work from home. Uh, they are only saying that they're working, but they're not really working. And uh, even if in some organizations and in some industries work from home was uh, allowed, it would be allowed only to certain people in certain teams and in certain roles and more specifically women. Women who are coming back from a maternity break would be allowed to work from home. Women who are pregnant would be allowed to work from home and so on and so forth. But men asking from a work from home request and working from home was not something that uh, was very was very common. And right now, you know, like I keep saying this um, in my friend circle that it did not take COVID for work from home to be normalized. It took men to work from home for this to be normalized. Right. So when everybody now works from home, irrespective of their designations, irrespective of their genders, irrespective of their teams and roles, they realize that, hey, it's absolutely possible to handle my house and my job and still be able to do a good job at both of them. And I'm not taking away the pressure that uh, a lot of us feel when we are working from home because a home environment is very different than an office environment. Uh, sometimes people don't have a separate room to sit and work. So there will be children, there will be parents, there will be uh, there will be probably a cooker whistle going on somewhere. And um, these terms were earlier looked at with the raised eyebrow saying, oh, you know, this person's working from home. So they are hardly working. But today, when everybody is doing that, it is not looked at as, oh, that's a distraction because everybody is taking care of their work in midst of these distractions. And that takes us to a fact that the business solutions have become so innovative. And, and I'm talking about innovative solutions from the perspective of few examples that I gave you, right? Everybody still needs to see doctors. We still have medical concerns. If we can't go to hospitals, how do we get them sorted? By getting on an online consultation. We still have learning needs. We still have training requirements. How do we take care of that? By getting onto e-learning or online courses or webinars like these. Uh, at the same time, our clients still want to connect with us. There, were, there are businesses where the clients only work on face-to-face -face meetings, not on emails. So how do you get that connect going? By getting on technological tools like Zoom, Google Meet, and so on and so forth, right? So a lot of businesses have come to solutions where the solutions are very innovative and that to a very huge extent are also saving us money and are also effective. But we never had the need of thinking about them in the previous scenario. In fact, a lot of organizations have already announced that even after COVID gets over, they will still continue to have a certain percentage of their workforce to work from home. They don't want these people back in office, not because they don't want them back in jobs or <clears throat> they don't have work, work spaces for them for, to accommodate them, but they're saying, hey, it's not really required. We didn't realize that we didn't need them to be physically in the office to do their jobs well, because they're doing a fair job at home and that's absolutely okay, right? And I just touched upon the virtual learning piece as well in terms of its effectiveness. Earlier, I remember as a learning professional, every time we'd go back to a client or a business to say, hey, we are going to <coughs> offer you a learning solution. Uh, they'd come back and say, no, can you please get, uh, you know, do a classroom training for us? We want the trainer to be in front of us when we are taking the training. And today, everybody is okay to attend a virtual training program, a virtual webinar, a virtual discussion, an e-learning course, because they are now okay to look at the effectiveness objectively. And those are the myths that I see busted during this time of Corona crisis. 
okay and i'm happy to take you through to a report that substantiates a lot of what i'm saying but before i move to the next slide what are the questions that i can answer or any addition you'd like to make to the myths that i've talked about it will be a, a lot more interactive and effective for all of us if we are able to um, speak up and ask either, each other questions otherwise it's going to be very boring like a school professor speaking for an hour <laughs> so you could really ask your questions or speak up or agree or disagree whatever works for you anyone has any questions okay that's all right you can ask your questions later as well when you do think of them but this is what i wanted to share with you now like i said a lot of um, things that we talk about are habits right and um, is it possible for us to change habits scientifically the answer is yes is it easy no a lot of um, uh, concerns that even reach to a point of an addiction literally like a phone addiction for example start off as a habit or a smoking addiction start off as a habit and then we get to a point where we find it very difficult to change it so we assume it's never going to change or it's absolutely normal to do that right but scientifically uh, we consulted a psychologist to understand what does the habit changing cycle look like right and what he told us was that typically there is a routine that most people follow for example everybody gets up and brushes their teeth healthy and acceptable right so when you are brushing your teeth that is a routine thing that you do every single day what you need to do to yourself right you need to attach something to that and what i mean by that is the moment you start your day signal that starts the routine is a trigger for you so brushing your teeth is a trigger the moment you have done that piece that's a trigger you move into something that you want to build as a habit for example exercising a lot of people are complaining that during this time they have become unhealthy they have gained weight they are not eating they are not walking and so on and so forth you know gyms are closed and all of those pieces right there is barely any movement everybody is sitting at home and many many other things so the moment you have a trigger immediately after that trigger start doing an action that you start want to build as a habit like exercising and what what is it that you get out of that is a reward of that habit that you're trying to form when you start seeing that you're becoming healthy or your weight is reducing you continue this habit loop every day after the trigger you start your routine and you look forward to the reward whether it is something which is something as critical and important for everybody as exercise or something as simple as hey i'm going to put an alarm on my phone that if i am working on a laptop and i have not gotten up for 2 hours it will give me an indication that you need to get up and walk around so i'll get up from my chair i'll walk around for 5 minutes i'll go get a get a glass of water for myself come back and sit again so a trigger forms a routine for me that gives me a reward and it can be done in any scenario whether it is taking care of the family whether it is to handle something at office whether it is to take care of your health or or any other pieces that you can think of right or even in terms of workspaces in terms of your formal relationships there is a there is another example i can share right for client relationships you put in an um, a meeting invite or you put in a task on your calendar that says after every 15 days i'm going to call my client and say hello how are you how's everything is everything all right anything i can do for you right and that trigger is going to form into a habit that i that i start building which is getting in touch back with my client the reward is my client relationship gets much better and th this particular loop can be used in any scenario by anybody whether it's a child or an adult or a man or a woman irrespective can anybody share an example in their respective uh, teams or uh, kind of departments that you work in that you can use this trigger anything that you can relate with
anybody at all? Okay, if that's the way it goes, then I'm absolutely sure that we won't need the full time we have blocked. We'll be done much earlier than that. All right. Okay, this is the report that I was referring to. Uh, this report has been published by an organization, a research organization called People Matters. And what they've talked about in the report is during a survey that they did with, with organizations in India, uh, the length of everybody's day in terms of the number of hours they are working or the number of hours they are not taking rest has increased by 15%. The focus time that they were able to deliberately give to their uh, tasks, whether it is a work related task or otherwise, has reduced because of the number of distractions. Um, in terms of an office scenario, the managers are getting more in touch with the team members. So manager time clearly has increased with the outreach. Earlier, we'd walk up to somebody and say, hey, you know what, let's go have a cup of chai and we can talk about so and so things or let's have a meeting. Let's everybody catch up in the room in the meeting room and talk about the following agenda points. Now the recurring meetings are taking care of that miss. The interruptions from chat, meeting, email has increased because people can't talk to you anymore. They can't pick up the phone and speak with you because you don't have a desk phone unless you are connecting with each other on mobiles. So they are constantly pinging, constantly chatting with you or emailing you. And the same scenario with the inter-team collaboration, right? Overall collaboration, however, has seen an increase simply because the, the recurring meetings have increased, simply because the manager outreach has increased, simply because people are now starting to make an effort to be in touch with each other because you can't see each other, right? So physically being able to see each other also is, uh, is a very important piece of building relationships and connections. But today people are unable to do that. So overall collaboration from a perspective of um, virtual connection has increased. This data uh, has been collected typically from most um, office softwares like Office 365, G Suite. G Suite is the Gmail, G Chat, um, Google Meet sort of a, uh, entire suite and more such tools that are being used by offices and organizations. I'm happy to answer if you have any questions here. I've written down the uh, all the findings here for you so that you can read it as well. Take a moment to read it and then we can move further. OK. Um, this is something that uh, I think is going to be very, very uh, important. And unless you respond, this exercise is going to be a, a complete waste. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and you need to guess who that person is. Are we ready for that? Well, Are we ready for that? Box as well. So people who, who don't want to unmute their mics can I'm use sorry? the chat box. Absolutely, you can use the chat box as well. And in case there is a background noise and therefore you're not unmuting, please don't worry about it. It's absolutely normal now. So don't worry about that. Okay. Uh, this person was born to an unmarried teenage mother. Lived in rural poverty, wore dresses made out of potato sacks. Nine was At nine, where she was molested by her cousin and uncle. At 14, after years of abuse, she became pregnant, had a stillborn child was then sent to her father, who made education her priority, became an honor student, and she was voted the most popular girl at high school. At 17, won a beauty pageant, got a job at the radio station, an incredible success and gained a huge fan following in the media world, found a company called Oxygen Media in 1999 and became one amongst the most powerful and wealthy people in the show business. This person is an international celebrity. Can anybody make a guess? And I'm sure that all of us have seen her in, in some form or other in one of these roles of hers. Any guesses? No idea? No. 
Okay. Do you know this name? Yeah. Oprah Winfrey, right? She is the person who I'm talking about. According to the Forbes magazine, she's the richest African American of the 20th century. And she, she's the only black billionaire for three years running. With that background, with that kind of a situation that she came from, she reached where she reached. And there, I'm now getting into a part of a session which is very sensitive. And I need you to look at it objectively. If you have any disconnects, I encourage you to talk about those on the call right now. All right. It's very important that you speak up and there's nobody who's going to judge. I can promise you that. When we are talking about um, strong women or tough women, can anybody tell me what does being tough mean? What does a tough woman or a strong woman mean? And there are a couple of women on the call. I, I could see that. So anybody who can make a comment. And I'm, I'm absolutely going to be delighted if a man gives me the definition or an example. Be bold in Anybody? Bold, in, uh, bold at any situation, to face any situation. Very good. Thank you. I like the word. Bold in any situation. She's able to take care of every situation she, she is in. Wonderful. What, what else could it be? The, the woman who can speak openly in front Certainly of Certainly, it is being bold. What else? The woman who's confident to speak openly. Thank you. What else? Prepared Anything else in, you'd like to contribute? Prepare to hold in any situation. Prepare to hold in any situation. Thank you. And that's absolutely wonderful for, for me to hear you guys talk. I think it's very important. Um, what we're talking about here is how a strong women made. It's not easy, right? Uh, we're talking about women who are able to, to be um, able to handle any situation. They are bold and they don't bow down. Women who are able to and confident to communicate in front of people. Right. So it's definitely not a very easy task from the fact that traditionally um, over centuries and not just in India, but specifically in India, we come from a background traditionally where men are termed as the only bread earners of the house and women are supposed to take care of the house. Right. Uh, does it ever does it ever get to your mind how much pressure we are putting on men? We are constantly telling them that you are the only one who needs to earn and run this family. And we are constantly telling the women that even if you are not cut out to take care of a house and birth children, you still have to. What if they want to swap? And what if the, the, the man says, hey, you know what? Uh, I want to take care of children at home and you are interested to work, you are confident and you are bold, why don't you go out and, and work while I will take care of the house? When that happens, people raise their eyebrows and turn around. Right? And when women go out and work, they go, oh, that's wonderful. I'm not sure she's able to spend any time at home. Oh, I wonder why is he working and probably putting the clothes for drying in the balcony? Is his wife not available? And these are statements that all of us have heard. But sometimes we are shying away to say that we've heard these statements or we've made these statements, right? So what are strong women made of? They're emotionally intelligent. What I mean by the word emotionally intelligent is first come first, being aware of your own emotions, being aware of what you want. And secondly, being aware of what people around you want. There is a balance that we need to strike. How do we strike that balance? How do we ensure that because of traditional respectives, we don't put pressure on one gender or one role in the family? How is it that we gain that insight? Right? And I'm going to share a story here. And I love talking about this story. It's called the sausage story. Um, and there's a little child who goes to uh, the the mother and says, Mom, have you, um, in fact, let me ask you, have you ever seen sausages? Has anybody seen sausages? 
what does the sausage look like <clears throat> sorry i have a bad throat what does the sausage look like anybody okay a sausage look li looks like a long piece of meat mostly and it ha it is tied with its, with with a thread of sauce on both sides right <clears throat> that's what a sausage typically looks like now this little child goes to his mother and says every time you cook the sausages you cut out the corners why is that a child being a curious one the mother says um, i don't know this is how your father taught me how to make because i don't eat non vegetarian food he eats it and he told me that's how it's made so go make it and that's how i make it the child says okay goes to the father and says that how why do we cut cut out the edges of the sausages every time we make them father says well, i don't know that's how your grandmother taught me so the, the child goes to the grandmother and says grandma why do we do it the grandma laughed and she said you know why are you asking he said well every time my mother makes sausages in the kitchen she cuts out the edges and i always wonder why does she do it she doesn't know daddy doesn't know so i'm asking you the grandma laughed and said come sit in my lap i'll tell you the boy sat with her the grandmother says you know many many years ago uh, we weren't very well to do so the 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 kitchen only had one saucepan and the saucepan was a little smaller in size so to ensure that a sausage fits in well in the, in the uh, in the saucepan instead of cutting the center which was a meaty chunk i would always cut the corners just to ensure that the sausage fits in the saucepan or the frying pan and that's how your father saw it being done and what he saw he never questioned he told the wife the wife never questioned she just did what she was told we just keep following things that we have been following for so many years without understanding why things are being done the way they are being done is there a reason if there is a logical reason fantastic but if there is no reason why don't we question it questioning can get us two answers either we'll get to know the reason and we'll say okay it makes sense let's continue or we'll say hey you know what it doesn't make sense let's do something better than this right but we out of the fact that hey it's always been done like this don't question the status quo right and one of the most famous personalities nelson mandela made a statement and said if we always keep doing what we've done we will always keep getting what we have got there is no change that will happen and to make a change you need to start understanding or start questioning okay so that's about being emotionally intelligent strong women also of course have to be physically healthy if you're talking about somebody who's bold if you're talking about somebody who's outspoken somebody who wants to take responsibility of things that he or she does or around them and if they are not physically healthy themselves they will burn out and even physically healthy people after a certain amount of number of hours they need rest too right everybody does it's a human body and therefore physical health is very important specifically in times like these when we are when you are barely allowed to go out when the typically the house chores that would be done by an outsourced person for example a house help or a housemaid all of those pieces of work have fallen within the family members in many houses men are helping in many houses men are not but many houses women are doing it independently in many houses they're saying you know what it is the way it is i can't do more so depending on what's your setting there has been a gradual and an obvious number of increase of hours people are now the family members are now investing in their homely chores which were earlier being outsourced at a cost now all of that is happening at home by people and i'm telling you an example here um the other day i was talking to my supervisor and uh, i said what, what you know what are you doing right now and he said hey i'm talking to you because i knew we had this call and i did not need my laptop for it so while i'm speaking with you i'm washing utensils afternoon i take care of it and in the night my wife does because i have a lot of calls in the night 
and there was an absolute degree of matter of fact tone in his conversation saying yeah in the afternoons i do it in the night she does it we divide the work that way and which is absolutely fair and i felt very happy when i heard that right so that is what i mean in terms of division of work that's happening in the house mentally strong um a bold woman has to be mentally strong a woman who is mentally strong is not going to second guess herself in terms of the kind of decisions she is taking or the kind of decisions she ends up taking because of the time that she is working against right um a couple of quotes for you that convey the message i'll just remove this from here yeah a couple of quotes from you for people probably you've heard the names of it conveys the message that in it's in moments of decisions that your destiny is shaped right if in a moment of decision you're not able to take the right decision your destiny doesn't shape the way you want it to be and therefore to be able to take care of yourself and anybody else these are the three most important pillars emotionally intelligent physically healthy and mentally strong having said that um we haven't reached a maturity in terms of in terms of these three things that i'm talking to you about right and i'm specifically now talking about india we've conducted a couple of surveys and we've realized that there is a great amount of um self criminalization women do to themselves right um, and and i'll share a very interesting harvard study uh, there was a job harvard study that said you know every time we get um uh, job applicants and we roll out an application for a vacancy for example if there are 10 prerequisites or 10 requirements of the job a woman will only apply for that job when she is able to meet about i'm sorry or somebody trying to say something no ma'am okay okay sure no problem um so a woman will only apply for the job when out of 10 she is able to meet less, at least about 8 to 9 requirements that's when she will feel confident to apply for the job because if a man is saying you know what i am meeting probably five or six requirements but i'm going to learn the rest on the job and i, I feel confident enough to apply right Mama, yes yes give me a moment Mama. tell me what it is it's on your email what it's on your email go check children are studying for their exams anyway coming back to what i was saying um so women only apply when they believe that they are almost there in terms of the minimum requirements while men will apply if they believe that they can learn it on the job they are far more confident they are far more um okay to take a risk they are far more okay to say this is something i can handle but women however are unnecessarily pulling themselves down in many cases right so it is not just the support that they sometimes don't get it is also about the belief that they do not show in themselves in many many situations and please understand i'm not generalizing any of these and i'm not saying that all women do it or all men do it i'm talking about scenarios that are backed up by research right um so so this is the kind of scenarios where we've noticed that women don't really go out and say i'm okay to take this risk i'm fine and i will take care of the uh, you know circumstances after that as well which is why a lot of times there are a set of instructions women end up following and and which is why they end up demeaning themselves in many many scenarios right i will share those pieces with you do you want something give me a moment please biba ask daddy he'll tell you it's in the other account i'll tell you i'll send it to you hmm? yes <laughs> sorry about the disturbance um so with that let me show you a list of things that that um we picked up from various documents we picked up from a couple of reports that talk about what is it that we should ensure we do as women and um this this list i very very fondly call it as the forbidden 13 the word forbidden means is something you should not be doing 
This comes from Amy Morin. She's also an author and a publisher. You can check if you want on the internet as well, a couple of other pieces she's written and very, very interesting ones as well. So these are a few pieces that she suggests we shouldn't be doing at all. And I'm going to read each of those for you so you are able to see those clearly. Insisting on perfection. Compare oneself with anybody else. <clears throat> Fear of breaking rules, staying silent even when things are not going their way. Putting down others to lift oneself up. Allowing others to limit one's potential. Blaming oneself when bad things happen. It's only because of me. My child is not doing well because I'm not giving my child enough time. Or my house is not clean because I'm not cleaning it. Right? Owing one's success. I'm only able to do this because my family is supporting me or my husband allows me to work. You know, even famous artists and, and uh, uh, actors of our industry makes that, make that statement in their interviews, right? After being extremely successful actresses, women make statements like my husband allows me to work in, in films with other actors. Shying away from tough challenges, overthinking everything, self-doubt, Hesitating to reinvent oneself. And this typically happens with women when they are changing industries or they're coming back after a break. And vulnerability as a weakness. It is not weakness to be vulnerable. It is, in fact, showing emotional strength. It is telling you that even you are sensitive. Even you can fail. And it's okay. It's a risk. You're taking it. And you're going to move on with it. And you, you're going to be able to handle what happens after the risk. This is something if you haven't yet made a note of, I insist that you do because it's very important that you start thinking on these terms, specifically irrespective of the gender you belong to. I, I think, and Amy Morin wrote this for women, but I think it is also important for men to follow a lot of these pieces because in many cases, we don't realize the pressure men are under. And in many, many cases, we, you know, for example, vulnerability as a weakness. Men don't cry. There are advertisements on the TV all the time saying, don't be a girl. Men don't cry. What does that even mean? Right? You're telling me that if you are born as a man or a boy, you're, you should be okay to take pain. And you can't say that, hey, I'm in pain or I need help. Why should that be the case? That, that's essentially telling yourself that it's okay for you to take that amount of pressure. Staying silent. There is a point of time when even, when even the most successful people come out and say, hey, this is too much for me. I can't take it. And it's okay to say that. You don't have to be that perfect person at all times because it is not possible to be a perfect person at all times. Right? So please, I insist for you to make a note of these pieces. And then we can move to the next slide. I'll allow you a couple of seconds. And in the meanwhile, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. OK, is it OK to move on? Have you made a note? I'm assuming you have. OK, so I'm going to move on irrespective. 
Um, this is probably the last leg of our discussion. It is called as recognizing and embracing the differences. And one of the points that you see here are very close to my heart. It's called unconscious bias. Many times we don't even realize that we are biased towards something or someone. And, and what that starts to do is it starts to reflect in our work. And um, it is, you know, acceptable. And it is scientifically proven that each individual, each person, a human being has to be biased. You cannot function without bias behavior because bias comes out of how we are brought up how we are raised, what are the circumstances we have faced, what are the challenges we have faced, where we are today. It comes from our environment. It comes from people. It comes from our experiences. So for instance, I have uh, a bad experience of getting stuck on a certain road every time I try and travel to work, right? So every time I go on JVLR, I get stuck in traffic. So I have a bias against JBLR saying that every time I go there, I'll have to add additional half an hour to 45 minutes to my journey because I will certainly get traffic jams. And that's nothing but a bias. Biases can be as simple as this and as severe as, hey, I am not going to go to that country or, hey, uh, I don't believe that country is clean for me to go or I don't believe that sector is a good sector for me to pick up a job and so on and so forth. Or I don't believe that when coming back from maternity break will be able to effectively work in a job that's high uh, pressure. I don't think it's possible. Or let's say uh, in night shifts, we can't have women working because it's not OK for women to work in night shifts. All of these are biases. Nothing else, right? Um, personal guilt. A lot, and like we said in the previous slide, personal guilt starts to reflect at work. The moment I feel that I am responsible for something that's going wrong, I will not be able to effectively function in the other roles of my life. And that starts to reflect in the work scenarios as well. The, the differences that we also saw during the COVID time and before as well is flexi location and flexi timing. There are people who need flexible hours to work for whatever reason. Somebody who's taking care of an elderly person in their family, somebody who's traveling two hours to get to the office and going back, need probably an hour lesser in their work day. And that hour they cover up before they come to work or after they reach home, right? A workplace stigma of, oh my God, working from home is not effective. Or if I'm going through a personal situation like, um, Let's assume I've recently had an accident and I'm using a crutch to walk. Or let's say somebody who is um, a victim of um, domestic violence. Or let's say that somebody who's recently not been promoted because of whatever reason. All of these things, they start converting them into, oh, he's the same person. And that becomes a stigma for that individual. And workplace stigma is a very common phenomenon starts to happen in most places and without even realizing without unconsciously without even realizing we participate in these pieces right so high time we recognize it and we embrace the difference we've talked about learning with team members virtually we've also talked about the fact that when we are doing all of these pieces right one of the most important piece as a manager as a leader irrespective of what gender irrespective of what industry is empathy. There are situations that you will have at home. For example, how my child just walked in and said, you know, I need my homework email. This could happen to anybody else as well. I can choose to be embarrassed about it or I can go out, go out as I'm on an official call or whatever, or I can say, hey, hang on, I'll send it to you and I'll let you know that give me a moment for that. These are scenarios that can happen to anybody and everybody. So empathy in virtual scenarios is the most important skill specifically for leaders because your people can't see your leadership skills anymore there is no personal connect with the people and therefore empathy is the only way you can connect with their heart and it's important for for people to know that they are wanted they are important and they're respected in their workspaces right which is what also connects us to the thinking a typical manager has we are going to reassess we are going to redefine how typical managers have thought all this while. Number of working hours used to be a contribution to performance. Number of meetings you've had in terms of converting those to potential benefits used to be 
a contributor to your performance and your yearly rating you can't have those pieces anymore and those need to be reinvented rethought redefined and reassessed right a question i'm going to leave with all of you are you and is the indian culture amicable to a work from home setup for all genders if yes it's fantastic if you think no you know what changes you need to make and you know a lot of people say if i make a change the culture of the country is not going to change i get that but i'm sure you've also heard that small differences start big movements so there is your contribution that goes at least into your world and slowly that starts to spread and the small difference is going to start making a big revolution all right so that's it from me on this perspective and i'm very happy to answer any other questions that you may have rupali in case you see anything uh, let us know on the chat window i'm okay to take those questions Yes, sure. Anyone has any questions? Can just ask right now, or you can put it on the chat. I I don't see any um questions here. No, there's nothing on the chat box. I'm sorry you're on mute. Yeah, there is nothing. All right. If that's the case then if you do think of any questions you'd like to uh, get addressed or any clarification clarifications that you may want uh, feel free to write to rupali and lerisa and they will connect with me uh, to get your questions answered i'll be happy to to assist in whichever way rupali over to you rupali you're on mute yeah one minute uh this is comparatively a new uh topic or an idea or a thought probably uh, many of the organizations are working towards including diversity and due to this uh, pandemic and due to the change in the normal uh, you know uh, it is uh, things are moving ahead things are changing and things are people are accepting the new normal uh basically initially which you started uh, at the first uh, initial time of your session speaking about what has the pandemic uh, had a change or how the normal has changed so when we had the male counterpart working itself is a big uh, change in the from the gender perspective and of course there are a lot of things which will be coming up as and when the the new normal progresses or the acceptance level uh, gets much more mm -hmm. higher because with the new unlocking thing a lot of things will have to change because without this change uh, the organizations probably will not be able to uh, survive or sustain the pressure uh, so this kind of inputs uh, natasha ma'am which you have provided right now has been a new learning for us and pro uh, probably in the coming days uh, we would be implementing and uh, implementing or working towards accepting this and accepting this diversity and then moving ahead uh, so thank you very much for your um, facilitation though it was a small group but the contents of yours were very uh, apt and uh, proper for this uh, present scenario so thank you ma'am and thank you to all the participants thank yeah. you everyone we will we we'll let then yes yes certainly thank you thanks natasha most welcome bye bye